morning and welcome to the Vision Church broadcast. My name is Katie Patterson and I'm an impact director here at Vision Church. I just want to take a second to explain impact team. We have our ushers, welcome, hospitality, guest services, and parking. I just want to take a second to give you all a shout out and we just want to say we love you, we miss you, and we will be so glad when we can finally get together and serve with you again. We are broadcasting this morning from the Vision Kids Chapel of our future campus located at 1134 West Boulevard because construction is underway. We are only two miles from Metro School on the edge of Uptown and South End. We are currently transforming this space so that lives will be transformed in it. Today, we are one church in many locations. Please share this video and take a second right now to let us know where you're watching from. Over the past two weeks, we've had viewers worship with us from literally all over the world. I want to give a shout out to those who have watched from New Hampshire, Ohio, Rock Hill, South Carolina, Texas, West Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia, California, Utah, Florida, and all across North Carolina. We love and appreciate each of you. We are so thankful you are tuning in with us. Help us bring good news to even more people each week by sharing this broadcast right now. In doing so, you're partnering with us, the Great Commission, to go and make disciples. Let's talk about connect groups. Our church and our connect groups have not stopped meeting. We simply just moved online in order to comply with the request of our local government. Please visit visionchurch.com for times and links. So right now, I'd like to take a second to read to you a verse from Psalms. Um, Psalms 31, 14 through 15 says, but I'm trusting you, O oh Lord, saying, you are my God. My future is in your hands. And right now we are living in a time of uncertainty in regards to our health, our finances, our job security. But this verse right here reminds us that the Lord has our, our plans and our future in his hands, and his plan for us is perfect. We want to encourage you to continue to worship God through the act of giving. There are a couple ways you can give to help continue to advance the gospel. Online at visionchurch.com or via text. Simply text the amount you feel compelled to give to 84321. And now let's pray as we prepare for worship. Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you right now and we just thank you for your presence, Lord. We just thank you for never leaving us and never forsaking us. And God, as we just live in a world that's just so broken, Lord, you are perfect, you are made whole. And God, right now we just wanna lift up um, our community and our world, Lord, who are just struggling right now through this pandemic. Lord, I pray that you just um, just reach out and touch those who are really struggling, Lord. Um, I just pray that you just protect the healthcare workers, the teachers, um, the people in the front lines right now, Lord. God, we just know that you um, have a hand in this, Lord, and that this is just not um, unexpected for you, Lord. You, you knew this was coming, Lord. And so we just thank you for just protecting us and providing for us in every way, shape, and form. And God, right now, I just pray that uh, you just be with us as we um, enter into your presence through worship, God. I pray that you just um, help our hearts to be in the right place, Lord God, and that our minds are ready to just receive um, what you have for us today, Lord. We just thank you and we love you and we just um, we just bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God, you rose up. You rose up from that grave, God. We're so thankful that we, did, we just get to come here and sing that and proclaim that because there is no other that has risen from the grave. There is no other who took the weight of our sins and stood in our place and rose so that we may become his righteousness, that we may be washed by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful this morning. And God, I just wanna say, we're so thankful in this season. God, we're thankful that even despite the chaos and the uncertainty that we, we don't have to fear. We don't need to be worried because our supreme joy, our supreme truth, and our supreme confidence is placed on a rock that never moves, is placed on a rock that is our cornerstone, is placed in Jesus Christ who rose up from the grave. And we're confident in that. So as we continue in our worship, I just want to invite you, I want to invite you to posture your heart before the Lord. To allow Him to search your heart and to shine a light in any corner that is not pleasing to Him, in any corner that's holding back from giving your full self to the Lord. God, we, we love, we love you. But God, we, we just adore you and we want to praise you this morning. And while everybody else in this world may be wondering why this is all happening and may, may, may be asking questions and may be uncertain and maybe even frustrated with the circumstance, God, I ask that we just get to stand up on that rock and proclaim that you are a miracle working God, that you never stopped then and you haven't stopped now and you will not stop because you are the most high king that is seated on the throne and he will not get off of that throne. It is rightfully yours. So God, we wanna worship you. We wanna sing about how you are a miracle working God. And we believe that you see this season that we're in, that you know this season that we're in and that you still can perform miracles. But God, the greatest miracle has already been done. Our salvation has already been won. So if you don't know the Lord, I wanna invite you to receive him. God, we love you. God, we thank you and we worship you. The one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear is silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. I believe in you, oh I believe in you, yes you're the God of me.
Yes, I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Oh, I believe in you. Yes, I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Oh, I believe in you. Yes, I believe in you. Yes, you're the God of miracles. Good morning and welcome to the Vision Church broadcast. My name is Tyson Coughlin and I'm the pastor here at Vision Church. We're coming to you this morning from the Vision Kids Chapel at our future home here. In this space behind me is where your children are going to learn to worship God and fall in love with him. Uh, I can't wait to be in this space. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be transformed. We have a saying that we're going to transform this space so that lives will be transformed in it. Hey, I want to pray with you right now. Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, the sweetest name we've ever known. And Father, I ask that today that you would move through me today, speak into the lives of your people. I pray, God, that we would not be distracted, but I pray that your word would illuminate right before our eyes. I pray that you would give us revelation and truth Set people free today. Save souls. Change lives. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Again, I want to take a second to just personally thank you so much for watching this broadcast. I want to encourage you, take a moment right now and hit the share button below because you never know who might watch the message of the gospel just by you sharing this on your page. So I want to encourage you to do that. And also, I want to encourage you to comment in the section. Let's engage one another. Let's say amen. Let's get hyped together because I believe we got a word from the Lord for you today. All the glory and the honor belongs to Jesus. I'm not here to entertain you. We're here to lift up his name. If you have your Bible, turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Before I read it to you, I just want to say a couple things really quickly. Number one, we miss you all so much, and we just cannot wait to when we're back reunited again together, and hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later. Just know that we're praying for you. We love you. Every Thursday night at 8 p.m. from right here in this space, we're doing a live prayer broadcast, and that's an opportunity for you to submit your prayer request in real time, and we're going to pray with you and agree together right there corporately. We may not be able to be together physically, but we can unite in the spirit and through the power of prayer. In this season, we're not going to sustain and just hold on and barely make it. No, in this season, we're going to thrive. We're going to advance and move the kingdom forward aggressively in the earth. And uh, one of the reasons that we're in the kids chapel is because construction is well underway at Vision Church. And it is amazing. They kicked us out. They are moving so fast. And just thank you for all your prayer and support. One last update before we jump into Luke 5, and that is that Back on Easter, I announced to you that we were going to begin the Our Bold Move campaign phase two. And if you're not familiar to Vision Church, that is our building fund fundraiser to help raise $200,000 for this campus. 
I'm pleased to tell you that since we announced that just a couple weeks ago, we've already raised $18,749. We're almost 10% of what we needed two weeks in. Come on, somebody, and give God praise. The Lord is faithful. He's using your generosity to further the kingdom. And the reason that we're doing phase two is for a couple reasons. Number one, we have to install an elevator in this building. Number two, we have to upgrade the electrical capacity to handle the elevator and the HVAC system. And then thirdly, we have to build another parking lot over here to accommodate more souls. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to speak a little life over you. Y'all better get ready because when we open this place this fall, Lord willing, this fall, it's going to be packed. It's going to be overflowing with people, families restored, marriages healed, lives changed, souls saved, and disciples made. I'm going to tell you, we're going to be multiple services out of the get-go in this campus. You better get ready. It's going to be amazing. We're excited about it. So if you would like to be a part of that Our Bold Move campaign phase two, you can head over to visionchurch.com and you can give either recurring or you can give a one-time gift there. And anything that you feel led to give is greatly appreciated. We love you and sincerely thank you. Luke chapter five, beginning in verse 17, the name of this morning's message is called Bring the Broken. Come on, somebody in the comment section right now and type in there, bring the broken. That's the name of the message. Luke chapter five, verse 17. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all of Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat, and they tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some of the tiles, and they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to them, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? It is easier. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with wonder and awe and they praised God exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Man, I love that passage of scripture. It is incredible. So epic. For those of you who've been to church for any time, this is a fairly familiar story about the paralyzed man as he is lowered through the roof in the middle of one of Jesus' sermons to be laid at the feet of Christ, and then he heals him right there. This morning, I want to take a few moments to pull out four powerful lessons Four, four powerful truths out of this text. And I truly believe that these takeaways can change your life and mine. And I want to encourage you, as we approach the word of God this morning, let us not come out of redundancy or familiarity or just because we're online and virtual, you're over here cooking and petting the dog and doing five other things. Let's take some moment, some time right now to lean in to God's word, setting all distractions aside so that the Holy Spirit can speak to us through this story. And I believe he will. The first thing that I want to share with you about this story, the first lesson is that we are to bring the broken to Jesus. We are to bring broken and hurting lost people to the feet of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible actually accounts this same story in two different gospels, the gospel of Luke and in the gospel of Mark. Mark's gospel tells us that there were four men who carried this paralyzed man all the way to the house where Jesus was preaching. 
And when the crowd had blocked them and they couldn't get to Jesus, they went up onto the roof and removed the tiles one by one and lowered this paralyzed man on his mat down through the roof onto the feet of Jesus where he was healed and made whole. The Bible doesn't really tell us much about these four men. It doesn't tell us if they were friends of the paralyzed man or acquaintances. We're not really sure. But one thing we do know is that this young paralyzed man was not capable of getting to Jesus on his own. There's one thing we know. He could not get to Jesus on his own power. He was unable and Really, he lived a miserable existence. To be paralyzed in this day and age, this moment in history, meant that you likely just laid on a mat, exposed to the elements, or finding any shelter you could, and you begged for sustenance, for food and and resources, day and night and night and day. It was a, a very painful existence that this young man lived. He was helpless. He was dependent on others and confined to this mat. The Bible said that he suffered from palsy, meaning that he was unable to feel. He was unable to feel his extremities and his legs. He was paralyzed. We know that he was helpless and unable to get to Jesus on his own. But actually, I know that this story, we talk about the paralyzed man who was healed. But actually, I think that the story doesn't begin with the paralyzed man on the mat. In fact, I believe that the story really begins with these four men who were moved with faith for this one man who was paralyzed. And these four men had faith enough to believe that if only they could get him to the feet of Jesus, everything would change. The story really begins with these four men who thought in their heart and were filled with faith and believed, if I can just get him to Jesus, Jesus will change everything and give him a new life and a new future. It begins with the faith of four friends. Now listen, as we reflect on this story and as I think about this story, and I try to figure out who I would be in this account, you know, I would like to think that I'm one of the four carriers who carried my brother who was broken and paralyzed to Jesus. But the truth is, as we look at this, I'm not one of the four guys who carried anybody. The truth is, is that I used to be the man on the mat. I used to be the man that was paralyzed, laying there, dormant, unable to feel, unable to feel spiritually, unable to walk and thrive spiritually in a relationship with God. I was the one who was paralyzed by my fear, paralyzed by my guilt, my past, my shame. That was my condition, unable to make it to God on my own. But thanks be to God that while I was in that paralyzed state, there were people who carried me. And as I look back to all those years ago when I gave my life to Jesus, I can clearly see that God used men, he used people to carry me all the way to the feet of the master. And I'm about to preach to somebody this morning. Thank God that somebody carried you. When you didn't know any better to pray, people were praying for you. When you didn't have faith for your own salvation, when you didn't have faith to believe in God at all, there were people who never gave up on you. Thanks be to God that when we could not make it to God on our own, there were friends, there were family members, there were grandmamas, there were pastors, preachers, youth pastors who were carried carrying you all the way to the feet of the master. Thank God that there were people in my life who had faith long before I did. Thank God there were people praying for me when I wasn't praying for myself. Thanks be to God that there were people who lived as a true Christian, a light in the darkness. They were a true witness of the goodness of Jesus through their testimony in dark places. I I think back to when I gave my life to Jesus and I thank God for my pastor, Pastor Jerry Merle, the Way of Holiness Church in Buchanan, West Virginia, who Sunday after Sunday faithfully preached the uncompromised gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Listen, I came from a Catholic background. My family was Irish Catholic, all right? And I grew up in a church having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I knew about God, but I just didn't know God for myself. I, I, I just knew about him. And then a few years later, my parents took me to a non-denominational church right there in my hometown. And I thank God that Pastor Jerry was preaching the gospel, that he was preaching the word of God in truth and in boldness and in clarity. And as he preached that, that word, he may not have known it at the time, but God was using him to carry me to the feet of Jesus. I'm also thankful that when I was in my paralyzed state, my dad, my own dad, I'll never forget it. Um, I was about to go on vacation with my stepdad and my mom. We were going to go to Fripp Island, South Carolina, one of my favorite places as a kid growing up. And we were getting ready to leave. And my dad brought me over his Bible. And he said, hey, I, I want you to have this. I want you to take it and read it while you're on that vacation. And thank God he gave me that Bible because that summer while I was with my family at Fripp Island, South Carolina, one night as it was raining and storming, I opened up the Gospel of Matthew and began to read it. And as I began to read that Bible that my dad gave me, it became more than just a story. It became more than just a historical event. I believed it. It was life-changing and I knelt on a bedside right there and I repented of my sin I asked God to forgive me, come into my life. And I prayed a prayer right there. And I said, Lord, here's my life. Here am I. Use me. Take my life and use it however you want to. Thank God there were people that God sent to carry me. There were people that gave me Bibles, people that prayed for me, people that loved me. True Christians who lived out their faith. They weren't perfect, but they lived it out. Thank God there were people who carried me. And I pray this morning that as you watch this broadcast, I pray that you will be inspired to be a bringer. That you would bring people to Jesus. That you would find people who are broken and hurting and paralyzed by fear. Paralyzed by the pain of their past. Paralyzed by the condition of sin. And I pray that you would be that light, that you would be that witness. You would be used of God to pick up their mat and carry them to the feet of Jesus. You can be a carrier by having faith. See, I believe this man, his healing and his salvation, it didn't start with him. It started with the four men who had faith to believe that Jesus could save him, that Jesus could change him. And I'm bold enough to believe that some of your family members, some of your coworkers, your classmates, the people that, that don't know Jesus, that are around your influence, I'm crazy enough to believe that their salvation, their story of finding Christ is not gonna begin with them, it's gonna begin with you. It's gonna begin with a few of you who have the faith to say, if only I could introduce you to Jesus. If only I could carry you to the feet of the master, it would change everything. And I'm not saying that it's your faith that saves them, but it could be your faith that is the very catalyst that ushers them in to the very feet of the savior. I pray that you would be that person, be a bringer. Type that in the comment section right now. Say, I'm gonna be a bringer. I'm gonna carry somebody. I'm gonna bring somebody to Jesus. Be a light, share your testimony, share your story, share your love and kindness with the world around you. And I thank God that there were people who carried me because of their love and their faith. Now God is using my life to carry others into the presence of Jesus. It's so amazing. My story started with the faith of others and likely yours did too. There was somebody praying for you. Be a bringer. I want to ask you this morning, do you really believe that Jesus saves? Do you really believe that the gospel changes lives, hearts, and desires? Do you really believe the Bible's account 
of life after death? Do you really believe in an eternal hell that separates us from God eternally? Do you really believe in an eternal heaven where you are in the presence of an almighty God and he wipes away every tear from your eye and you are overwhelmed in the joy and the peace and the beauty of his holiness for eternity? Listen, if you really believe that Jesus saves, if you really believe the Bible's account of life after death, then may we this morning make up our mind that we are going to be a bringer, that we are gonna bring the broken to the feet of Jesus, that we're gonna lay aside excuses, we're gonna lay, a lot, we're gonna lay aside every other delay, and we are going to be about the Father's business, and we are gonna bring people to the feet of Jesus. There's no more beautiful work that can be done on earth than bringing someone to the feet of Jesus. Another thing that I want to share with you this morning is that bringing people to Jesus will inconvenience you. These four men who carried the mat all the way around the crowd and up the roof and removed the ceiling tiles just to get this man before Jesus, this was an inconvenience to them. I promise you that these four men had plans that afternoon. They had places to be, people to see, things to do. But they were willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of this man encountering Jesus. I wonder, are you willing to be inconvenienced so that other people can find Christ through your life? You see, today we have one conversation with somebody and we're like expecting them to repent and believe and ugly cry the first conversation. And when that doesn't happen, we're like, okay, well, better luck next time. We give up. You and I have to understand that we are waging war for their souls. We're doing everything we can like these four men to get them to the feet of Jesus. Be determined. Don't give up. Are you willing to be inconvenienced? Are you willing to let your schedule be interrupted for the sake of having that conversation, for the sake of sharing your faith? Are you willing to be inconvenienced? And by the way, it wasn't just inconvenient for them. It was heavy lifting. They had to carry this man. We don't know how long of a distance they carried him, but they carried dead weight a long way through the crowd and up onto the roof. It was heavy. It was burdensome. It was inconvenient. And the work of the Great Commission is inconvenient. And it will be heavy. It will be difficult. But here's the truth. It is worth it. Because one touch from Jesus changes everything. The second thing that I want to show you out of this text is that the crowd was blocking the way to Jesus. The crowd was blocking the way to Jesus. As the four men carried that mat, as they carried the mat, they tried to go in the front door and they couldn't. They tried to go through the window and they couldn't because the crowd, hundreds of people were crammed into this house to listen to Jesus preach and teach the gospel. And so because the crowd was so thick, they had to go up onto the roof to lower the man in. There's a powerful truth here, and that is that the crowd was blocking the way to Jesus. And the truth is this morning is that the crowd, the popular way of the world, is still blocking your way to the feet of of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. If you have your Bible, turn there with me this morning. I want to read this scripture to you. You enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose to follow that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. I want you to listen to this. He says that the way that leads to destruction is broad. It's wide. And many people go that way. The crowd, the way of the world, the masses of the world are following and headed in the path of destruction. This is a warning that following what is popular, following the crowd, following the mindsets and ideologies and cultural norms of our day are dangerous because the crowd and its way will block you from encountering Jesus Christ. 
The, the men who carried this paralyzed man, they went in the opposite direction of the crowd. The crowd was down on the lower level. And because the crowd was down, the four men carried him up. They went in the opposite direction. And this morning, I want to encourage you that you cannot be afraid to go the opposite way of the crowd. Being a true follower of Jesus Christ, a true disciple, in fact, will require you to forsake the crowd, to forsake the way of ease and popularity and notoriety for the sake of truth and holiness and perseverance. We must be careful that we do not follow the crowd. We have been called out of the world, saved out of the darkness and into God's marvelous light. If you follow the crowd, it will block the way to Jesus. Don't adopt the social and cultural norms of today where people compromise and they water down the word of God and they completely ignore pages and scriptures of their Bible. And just because it doesn't make sense or feel well in their heart, they completely ignore it. Beware of the politically correct culture that permeates our world today where we just want to appease everybody and make everybody feel accommodated and happy. Listen, Politically correct, this way that the world is moving, this way of the crowd will block the way of Jesus Christ. The gospel is offensive. It will offend people. Not not just for the joy of offending them, but the gospel is offensive because it confronts our sin. It confronts the evil desires and the wickedness of the human heart. The gospel commands that we repent and that we change. The gospel shines the light and exposes that we are sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. The world doesn't want to hear that. The way of the world wants to be like accepting of everything, tolerant of everything. Be careful of following the crowd because the crowd is blocking the way that leads to Jesus. There's a movement right now called progressive Christianity, where it's sweeping all through America and the world where people are just tolerant of everything. We're redefining marriage. We're redefining sin and what it is in the Bible because we want to follow our heart and we want to follow our feelings. And let me just warn you that that the word of God teaches that the heart is desperately wicked above all things. The heart is deceitful. Proverbs warns us that there is a way before every man that seems to be right. It seems to be good, but the end of the path is death. We cannot follow our heart. We cannot follow our emotions. We must follow the word of the living God. It is our compass. It is our guide. It is our path that navigates us through this world. Be careful of the ultra-tolerant and liberal mindsets. I'm not talking politically. I'm talking spiritually. Be careful. There's another movement right now that's sweeping through the church of universalism where people preach that, you know, the, the crowds are preaching that, you know, all the major world religions are the same, basically. They just have different names. Allah is the same as Jehovah. They're all the same. Buddha, they're all pointing to the same God, the same heaven. It's universalism. All faiths are not the same. They cannot coexist. They are rapidly different. Jesus is either precisely who he claimed to be, or he is the greatest liar and manipulator the world has ever known. You must choose. You must decide. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. There is only one way to the Father, and it is through the Son. These are lies that the crowd is spreading, and if you listen to the crowd, and you go along with its ways, and its deceitfulness, and you are influenced, and you adopt the mind mindset of the crowd, it will block you from reaching Jesus. My God, my God. I also have to warn you too, that in the crowd that day, there were many Pharisees. They seemed to be religious, but they were actually instruments of evil. There were people that day who appeared to be right, but they were really wolves in sheep's clothing. I want to warn you that also in that crowd were a great number of Pharisees and teachers of religious law. Listen, 
They were so close to salvation. They literally heard the message of the gospel. They heard Jesus Christ preach and teach right there in the flesh. Yet they heard, but they did not listen. They heard, but they never applied it. They listened, but they never truly believed in their heart. They came so close, yet they were so far away. And I pray that that would never be said of you. Be careful of the crowd, even the church crowd. There are religious people within it. Be careful. Be careful that you don't hear and see and and, and experience the goodness of God and yet reject it in your own heart. The Pharisees, they refused to believe and they had no sense of their own spiritual condition. While they watched this man lowered from the roof, this paralyzed man healed, they had no love for him. They had no compassion for him. All they could care about was themselves and tearing down Jesus so that they could be edified. That's all they cared about. It was self-serving. They were there for the wrong reasons. Be careful because what was happening right before the eyes of the Pharisees, their own spiritual condition was being revealed and displayed through the paralyzed man right before them. And they were completely oblivious and they completely missed it. That that was the picture of them in the spirit. That was the true condition of their soul, paralyzed and spiritually dormant. And they missed it. Be careful that you don't become so close and so familiar with church that you, that you let the gospel just come through one ear and out the other. Be careful that you don't get so accustomed and so familiar to worship and the things of God that you fail to allow him to change you and to mold you. May we be reconciled to God. The third thing that I want to extract from this text today is that we've got to take off the tiles. We've got to take off the tiles. After the four men had carried their friend up onto the roof, they had overcome the crowd, and they're now right above the house where Jesus is teaching. They ran into one more obstacle, and it may have been the greatest obstacle that they faced. It was the tiles, the shingles that covered the roof. But in their love for their brother and in their faith in Jesus, they were determined that they would, they would stop at nothing. So they literally took the tiles off of the ceiling to lower their friend to the feet of Jesus. Now you got to feel this for a moment because there's something powerful here. In this house, people are likely shoulder to shoulder. It's likely that there are hundreds of people gathered to listen to Jesus preach and teach. It's likely the greatest sermon that they've ever heard. They're captivated And in the middle of his sermon, they begin to hear a commotion above them. They begin to hear people rustling around. And and before long, they feel dust and debris falling from above them and light shining down. And and all of a sudden, before you know it, they see faces peering down, interrupting the sermon of Jesus. And now they start to lower this man, this paralyzed man on his own mat down into the crowd, right at the feet of Jesus. These men stopped at nothing to get their friend to Christ. They took off the tiles. Now here's what this represents. The tiles represent our excuses. Think about it. These men had gone through a great distance of carrying this man on a mat. They had already overcome the crowd. They had climbed up onto the roof. And now they find one more barrier standing in the way between them and their Savior. Most people would have given up. Most people would have said, that's enough. It's time to turn back. There's no way. But these men refuse to give up. They refuse to quit on their friend. They refuse to quit praying, quit believing. They never gave up on him. Even when people give up on themselves, they never gave up on him. And they removed the excuses. Every tile that they peeled back represents an excuse in our life. And there are some of you who you have been witnessing. You have been sharing your faith. You have been praying for people. You have been sharing your testimony, but it still feels like there's a barrier. It still feels like you're so close, but so far away. 
away and you've allowed yourself to believe excuses that, well, I don't want to cause a disruption. I don't want to be rejected. I, I don't know if I know enough. You know, what if they find out about my past and they call me a hypocrite? What if they reject me and think I'm crazy? These are the excuses that you've got to peel back. These are the tiles that you've got to take off because they are the last thing standing in the way of people coming to know Jesus. Many Christians today refuse to share their faith. They refuse to lower people to the feet of Jesus because they feel like they're inadequate. They feel like they're not good enough. And that excuse hinders them from taking the next step. There's people today that they feel ashamed of their past. They feel ashamed of their mistakes and they think they'll be called a hypocrite and that's why they don't share their faith. But I wanna challenge you this morning that you've got to remove the tiles. You've gotta remove the excuses because they are the last obstacle in the way of others knowing Jesus. And quite possibly this day, as they stood on the roof, peeling back the tiles, the greatest excuse, the greatest tile left to move was that that they didn't want to be rejected. They didn't want to cause a scene. They didn't want to disrupt their family. And many of us, we don't share the gospel. We don't share our faith. We don't share our testimony with other people. We don't go out of our way to bring them to church or to bring them to Christ because we fear rejection. We, refer, we, we fear disrupting our relationship with them. I want to speak into your life this morning, like the four men, remove the excuses, remove the tiles, let nothing stand in the way this morning, because there is nothing more important than people finding Jesus. And remember, they truly believed that one encounter with Jesus Christ would change everything. And the same Christ who set this man free is alive and active and moving in the earth today. And he is mighty to save. Don't let your excuses stand in the way of somebody experiencing a touch from Jesus. Let us abandon our excuses this morning. Type it in the comment section and say, I'm removing the tiles. I'm removing my excuses. I'm letting them go today in Jesus' name. Listen, for some of you, you need to pick up the phone and call that person and say, hey, listen, You've been on my heart. You've been on my mind. And I just got to tell you that Jesus loves you. I got to tell you what he's done for me. I know you may think I'm crazy, but I've got to, I can't let anything stand in the way. I got to tell you how much he means to me. Some of you got to write a letter. Maybe you, you got a relative who is really hard to reach, or maybe you're not sure how they would receive the gospel. Write a letter to them. Pour out your heart. Tell them how much you love them and you want them to know Christ. You want them to find the healer, the Messiah. Write the letter. Do something today. Stop. I'm going to tell you something. A few years ago, um, the Lord really convicted me. I was out in public and in public I do something a little weird. I like... We'll just pray for people just under my breath. And I'll be like, Lord, save them. Lord, speak to them. I was at Subway on this particular occasion. And uh, Subway, you know, whatever you think about it. Anyway, I was getting a foot long, whatever. And I was praying under my breath for the woman who was making the sandwich. And I was in a hurry. I had places to be. And I just prayed. I was like, Lord, I pray that you would just save her. Save her soul, Lord. And I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I felt in my spirit, the Lord tell me, Tyson, I don't want you to pray for her anymore until you're willing to actually speak to her. I don't want you to pray until you're, until you're willing because faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. I want you to tell her that I love her and that I died for her. And I'm not kidding you. Right there in that subway, it was like a gas station subway too. It was kind of crazy. And there were people around. I was like, Lord, really? Are you serious right now? And so I just mustered up the faith. I removed the tiles. I removed the excuses. And I was just like, you know what? Ma'am, I got to tell you this, and this may sound crazy, but Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for you to save you and to forgive you of your sins. And that's literally all I said. And this woman, she didn't get radically saved. She didn't break down into tears, but you could see that those words touched her soul. You could see that the Holy Spirit was working and convicting and bringing hope and life right there in that moment. All it was was a seed. And in that moment, I was just one of the people on one of the corners of her mat carrying her 
to Jesus. Remove the excuses. Remove the tiles and let nothing stand in the way of others coming to know Jesus. And the fourth and final point that I want to share with you this morning out of this message is that this miracle is a metaphor. This miracle is a metaphor. And I've hinted at it all the way through this sermon, but I want to show you what I mean. Look with me at Luke chapter 5, verse 20. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 20. This is as the men lowered this paralyzed man down into the feet of Jesus. I want you to listen to this. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Now it's important that you catch this because people are standing shoulder to shoulder. They just watched the most powerful speaker they've ever heard be interrupted mid-sermon They watched a paralyzed man be lowered from the roof and set at the feet of Jesus. And I believe there was like a holy hush, a holy silence in all of that crowd that day as that man rested right at the feet of Christ. I think everybody in that room from the front to the back was silent and locked in, leaning in to watch and listen how Christ would respond. Would Jesus rebuke him? Would Jesus lash out at him for interrupting his sermon? And the answer is no. But what Jesus did say shocked everyone who was there. As this man is lowered at his feet, the crowd standing in in silence, Jesus looks at this paralyzed man laying on his mat and he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, That may sound ordinary to you or like, okay, well, that's what I would expect Jesus to say. But listen, I can imagine the disciples, especially Peter, standing in that room being like, yo, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed, but that guy that you just said his sins are forgiven, he's paralyzed. He needs a healing. He can't walk. Everybody in the room was expecting Jesus to heal the man. Everybody in the room expected Jesus to say, be healed. But initially, Jesus does not speak to his physical condition. No. The first thing Jesus addresses is this man's spiritual condition. He says, your sins are forgiven. In doing so, Jesus is acutely revealing to all of us that my priority, the reason that I'm here is not just to heal people. The ultimate reason that I'm here is to atone for sin, to forgive the sins of the world, to wash every mistake, every past failure away. Jesus addresses his spiritual condition first. This miracle is a metaphor for salvation. It is showing us the picture that we are the paralyzed man who had been lowered to the feet of Jesus. We could not come to God on our own. I know you think you made up your mind to come to church and you think you made up your mind to repent of your sin and you came to God. No, you didn't. You, it was not you and I who found God. It was God who came for you. It was God who carried you. It was the Holy Spirit who drew you to repentance and brought you to the feet of the Messiah. It was not us who found Christ. It was the Holy Spirit who brought us to the feet of Jesus. We are the paralyzed man, paralyzed by our sin, paralyzed by our fear, our past, our previous mistakes. We were unable to reach God on our own. The four men who carried us, they are representatives of the Holy Spirit who carried us to the feet of Jesus. And I love this part. I love this metaphor. Look at this. Finally, After Jesus forgives this man's sin, then finally Jesus says to him, stand up and take your mat and go home. Now look at this. He says, stand up. Now Jesus addresses his physical condition. 
Finally, Jesus addresses his paralysis and says, stand and take your mat. This is amazing. When Jesus tells him to stand up, this is the picture of the spiritual and physical resurrection. This is the picture, even if you will, of baptism, being raised to life. I was dead in my sin, dead in my trespasses, but Christ has raised me up. He has given me a second chance, a new life, a new future and destiny. When Jesus says to the paralyzed man, stand up, it's the picture of resurrection, spiritual resurrection and physical. And by the way, this man was healed physically and spiritually. And the truth is all who come to Jesus in faith, you will all be healed physically and spiritually. Yes, I said you will all be healed physically and spiritually. I didn't stutter when I said that. The truth is, is that all of us will be ultimately healed physically one day, whether it's here on earth or in heaven eternally. We will be given a glorified body. There is a promise of a physical resurrection. That's a whole nother sermon. But this man was made whole spiritually and he was made whole physically. And so too will you and I. Now I'm almost done. I'm almost finished here. Not only did the man stand up and that represent him being born again and new life and being raised to life, but Jesus told him something else. He said, I want you to pick up that mat. That same mat that you were carried on, that same mat that you were bound to and confined to, that same mat that you couldn't shake, that same mat that you couldn't escape, that you couldn't free yourself from, that mat that had dominion over you, that mat that held your life for years and maybe decades. Now, I want you to stand up and I want you to pick up up that mat. I want you to lay hold of the things that used to have a hold on you. And we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect. And the things that used to bind us, the habits that used to grip us, now we have dominion over them. Sin no longer has a hold on you. That mat no longer has a hold on you. To every Christian, there is a way of escape, a way of freedom. Before Christ, in your paralyzed state, that lust, that addiction, that greed, it had you. But now in Christ, you have been raised to life. And now Jesus says, stand up and take dominion over that mat. Carry that mat. It's now in your dominion and you're not under, not over you anymore. Come on, somebody, and give him praise if you believe it and if you see it. My God, my God, thank you for the power of the gospel. And in closing, I got to show you this. This is so amazing. So amazing. We who were carried in on the mat now leave carrying that mat. In other words, this is the call. This is the point here. When you got saved, somebody, somehow, the Holy Spirit, through his help, carried you to Jesus. And now that you have been raised to life, now that you've been given strength and health and born again, now it is your turn to take that mat and carry somebody else back into the loving arms of Jesus. You see, we have been raised to life. We have been carried to Jesus so that we may carry others. That's what I'm doing today with my life, with this church, with this sermon. I'm trying to carry you, pick up one of the corners of your mat and to bring you to Jesus. I once was dead and paralyzed too, but I've been raised to life and now it's my mission to bring others to Jesus. That's why he left carrying that mat so that he could carry others. I wanna ask you today, will you carry others? I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you're in this broadcast today and you're watching and you know that you are spiritually paralyzed 
You are dead in your sins, separated from God. You know that that's who you are. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we repent of our sin. We confess our many sins and failures to you. And Lord, right now, we ask you for mercy and for forgiveness, and we confess our sin to you. And we believe that 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He was perfect. He died in my place. And three days later, he was resurrected from the grave. And because he lives, I will live too. Because he's resurrected, I will be resurrected too. And I give you my life, my past, my present, and my future. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, be my strength and my God. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you were the paralyzed man on the mat, I want you to leave that in the comment section and say, I've been raised to life. I have been raised to life. Type that in the comment section like you mean it. And remember that you have been raised to life so that you can carry others right in to the feet of Jesus. Hey, listen, we love you so much. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We love you. Be blessed. And we look forward to being with you again someday soon.